Hello. How about now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. Hold on one sec. Yeah. Um, awesome. It will momentarily. Um, okay, can you hear me? On the computer? Okay. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> oh. oh, my gosh. Yeah, so I was I was so excited that I got all my tech up and working. I put I put the battery in backwards. <laughs> I'm, I'm an idiot. <laughs> well, thank you all for not leaving. You can hear me. Oh, that's great. We've never had so much discussion in the chat pod before. <laughs> oh. oh. Take two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we're here to talk about number knitting. <laughs> By Virginia Woods Bellamy, 1952. You know, it's based on her patented hand knitting method. And um, for what it's worth, I'm better at knitting than I am at tech. So, <laughs> oh gosh. Yay. <laughs> okay, so what I was saying, what I was saying is number knitting is all about garter, garter stitch. And I am, I've been taking you through the last few weeks of this blouse that I made. It's called Linen Blouse. And it, um, I made one before and it had some of the same issues that this one did. And I am, um, anyway, I wanted to show you what, um, I wanted to show you the pattern and kind of discuss like what the issue is with this. And you can see part of it, the issue is that it, is a little big it's a little big so let's let's take a look at the pattern and see why why this is okay so here is here is linen blouse and it says um, for the sizing she gives two size lists two sizes the first one is uh, small, 32 to 36. The large is 38 to 42. And what she tells you to do is to check the bias line across the first large square for fit across bust. Four times bias line equals bust measurement. And I had a little bit of a hard time with this initially, and I think this is one of the reasons Virginia didn't really um, offer a whole lot of sizes for this, is because to, to calculate the diagonal of a triangle is tricky. So in theory, the, um, the bias line would be measured from here to here. Let me bring my pointer up so that you guys can see it a little bit better. There we go. So the, the bias line is going to be measured um, here. But even if I was to do that on unit, the, the first large unit, that doesn't happen until unit nine. So unit, you know, one, two, three down here, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so um, you're going to be pretty far into the sweater before you get those um, those bias line measurements unless of course you just do a gauge swatch which as we all know I'm not a big fan <laughs> I should I, I'm a fan of gauge swatches I don't like doing gauge swatches because I just want to get down to it so anyway um, I knit this according to I got gauge I got three stitches um, what is the gauge the gauge is four stitches to an inch and I knit one box equals three stitches or three ridges. And so each one of these was like a 36, um, 36 by 36 square. And it's just 
a little big and I think um, I think I would adjust these measurements down because I don't know that Virginia took into account how um, the the bias line across here it really it really stretches and so anyway this this doesn't fit that great um, it will fit someone else but that someone else is not me because I don't know if you can <laughs> if you can see it keeps it keeps falling down I do want to show um, a funny thing in here there we go all right so this is linen blouse and it comes in the beginning of the costume design for men and women section and she gives words of wisdom in here remember to have a strapless bra boned and fitted to your figure as a bodice to match each suit the line of color beneath your number knitted blouse is always more beautiful for being unbroken from armpit to skirt hem while the shoulders are always lovelier without straps and that's I think that's true but the thing is if you if your sweater doesn't fit quite right <laughs> it keeps it keeps falling off I don't know maybe that's kind of sexy but maybe that's kind of like 1980s like junior high school I don't know but anyway but for the occasion because the model in the book was wearing a um, she was wearing a strapless bra um, for this picture <laughs> and so I thought why not why not I'll uh, I'll do the same <laughs> I'll do the same for tonight's show <laughs> even though it doesn't fit that great um, I think hers looks better because hers is like kind of see-through and this one is like kind of not see-through but anyway in the spirit of um, you know capturing history I decided to go for it <clears throat> Anita says use only the use the first couple of squares as a swatch. I I did that. I did that. But even still the it kind of stretches like the other squares they kind of they kind of stretch and um, anyway, I would I would probably adjust that sizing downward. I'm going to make another one. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to adjust it downward a bit. I think I'm going to use a smaller Maybe like I'll change the box number to like two and a half or two point seven five or something. I'll I'll count like how many stitches um, I would need here in order to get what I want. Um, but anyway, so along those lines, one of the other changes I made in the sweater is that if you look at the um, whoop, hold on, there we go. If you look at the original pattern, it has. It has several different um, needle sizes used. You're going to use um, a size, a size 10, to knit a gauge of four and a half st stitches to the inch, and then you're also going to use a size seven to knit five stitches to the inch. And one of the things I did when I was going through this book is I went and I, I color coded the charts to make it easier to, to see and I thought it would be worthwhile now to kind of show you guys how that works um, because if like some of the, pe the people that I've you know I've sold the book to like they like the color codes some of them not so much some of them I just don't even like tell them about it so anyway um, I have the book totally color coded with all the needle sizes according to the units on the the um, the chart generally speaking when someone buys the book I'll just I'll um, give their copy one that's not color-coded because I think as an end user like if you're the knitter I think it's really valuable like a valuable learning experience to go through that process of actually color-coding the charts yourself and so that's kind of generally why I don't give out the color-coded charts but that being said, I think it's worthwhile for you to know how to do it. And so I wanted to show you how to do that today. So I'm in Adobe Reader, um, which is the, well, I have Adobe Acrobat, but Adobe Reader, Adobe Acrobat, it's the same software, except if you want all the whiz -bang tools, you have to pay for it. Um, but the, the tool I'm gonna show you is, is just a commenting tool. It's, it's included in the free version and so what you're going to do is over on the right hand side you're going to open up this little comments pane and that'll show you the comments in the document um, so far 
you can see the ones that, that I've made already today. Um, but once you've, you've got your comment tool selected, you can go over here to the, um, the, the drawing markup tools, click on the one that says draw polygon. It's like a hexagon. And what that does is it's gonna let you just like click, click, click and like outline the shapes that you want. Um, and so I thought I'd go through and just show you guys how to do that. Um, so we're gonna do uh, neckline squares as well as units four, five, six, seven, and 15 are knitted on the smaller needles. And so let's, let's add some color coding here. So the neckline squares, and I'll show you how to make the color so that it matches. Just gonna outline this in neckline squares. And right now it's just a red box, but if you bring up the properties toolbar and you can get that uh, by clicking on help and just go to properties and it will show you down in the menu. Um, properties toolbar, there it is. So bring up the properties toolbar and um, it will let you adjust your colors here. So we want, um, it's like a, kind of like a pink color. And then we also want it with like a pink fill. But then this is annoying that Acrobat does this. It's, it totally obscures all the chart. But if you right click on it, and um, then click properties again, they hid the transparency like in a, a, another window, but you can kind of like dial back the opacity of it. And um, then you can see what color it is. And so you could go through using the, the little drawing markup tool and like color code all of the, the units for your pattern. Um, one, one other change that I did that I did make on here is that um, originally she said to do um, unit 24 and 20, so that would be like these, these underarm sleeve areas. She said to do that on the larger needles, but I tried that and it looks like, it looks really, <laughs> it looks bad. Like, like I'm wearing a diaper right in here. It's like all thick and bunchy. Um, so anyway, I changed that on this, um, on both times I knit this sweater. And Stephanie knit this sweater too, and she did the same thing, um, making those, um, those little side triangles on the smaller needle, because that's gonna help um, kind of bring this in here around the bust line and make it fit better. You know, um, Mishi B says, is that because it is wool and not linen yarn? No. <laughs> That's because my first one was a 50-50 cotton linen blend and I chose it specifically because it was called linen blouse and I, I couldn't, well, I, I didn't want to knit on 100% linen because I've done it before and it's, it's kind of miserable. Um, but the cotton linen was pretty nice. It was like a kind of in between a, like a worsted and a fingering. I guess that'd be like a DK weight, but no, it did the same thing. It did the same thing and it had like all the bunchiness right here. Um, yeah, and so if you guys have any ideas for like what we could call this thing, um, other than linen blouse, because that's not useful at all. And um, well, if you're not making it in linen, it's like not a linen blouse. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have any ideas, put it in the comments because um, that would be helpful for basically everyone going forward. All right, so that's, um, that's linen blouse. Okay, so I thought, I think I showed you like a, a weird whoo, a weird technique last week and I found I found another one that that is just, it's super weird and I've never seen it before and I wanted to, to show it to you. But first of all, I wanted to um, show you this, this yarn. So I got this yarn, this was one of those times where I just like went to a yarn store and wandered around and I picked up this single ball of yarn. I only bought one and I was like, oh, good gracious. I've never seen anything like this before. It's called Dan Don Linen. And it is, oh, it's 100% linen, which is interesting. Um, I suspect it would behave remarkably different than the linen I've worked with in the past, which was just like a three ply. Um, but anyway, what I thought was interesting about this, the, the little, the shop owner at this little shop, she 
said, do you, you know, do you know how to, how to fix that yarn so it doesn't unravel? And I was like, hold on now, like, what are you talking about? And she said that, um, she said that the company that makes this yarn, they don't tell people, like they don't warn people about it. And I was like, what? She said she had a, she sold some of this yarn to a customer and the customer made a beautiful tank top sweater thing out of it. And then she washed it. Cause you're, you're supposed to, this says uh, hand wash, but like I've heard you're supposed to be able to like wash linen in the washer and dryer. Um, but this says hand wash, but she said the woman washed it and the whole thing unraveled. Like, I was like, it unraveled? She said, yeah, the whole thing unraveled. And so she said, you, here, take note, here's what you have to do. And so then she proceeded to show me, um, to show me this, how this yarn was um, designed. And it's, it's a really interesting yarn because it's, um, it's like a, and it's hard to see, on the computer screen, it's got like two strands held together, so two strands of yarn, but then it's an I cord, but it's not like a three or four stitch I cord that we're accustomed to. It's like a two stitch I cord made with two strands of yarn. And I've never seen anything like it. And I don't know if you can see it on here, um, probably not that well, but I found somebody on, um, on Instagram recently, let me see if I can show you this. There we go. Let me show you that. And so what this is, it's, um, this is like a big version of it. And this lady is using something called a knitting fork. And it, it makes a two stitch I cord. And but this is obviously the big version, but this is the exact same thing that I have in my little ball of linen yarn here. And um, I just thought it was noteworthy to show you all because it's, it's not that often that I, I come across something in a yarn shop that I'm like, hold on now, this is brand new to me. <laughs> so I, I just, now that I kind of know what it is, I just thought it would be worthwhile to share. And that yarn is called Dandon yarn. I don't know what I'll ever do with it, but um, it's a specimen in my collection now. So that's fun. So for the linen blast, you all have some ideas. <laughs> oh. um, tank top, module vest. V-neck blouse, V-neck, the, the Kelly blouse. <laughs> oh, a versatile seamless sweater that may be dressed up or down or carry you from day to night. <laughs> huh, you know, maybe, Virginia did sometimes name her patterns after her friends, like the Hoyle's Garden Stair and the Lanier Circlet. Um, I think there was there was some others, but she did name patterns after her her friends. So I don't know if I'd want to name it after myself, though. I don't know. I like that idea, though, giving it a person's name. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe the Kelly tank top. I'm not sure. Good ideas, though. I'm gonna keep thinking on all that. <laughs> oh, and I did want to let you know. I put a link down in the um, the show notes um, for for this. So before, this is my old blog. So before I started Knit Swag, for like almost 10 years, I um, I wrote software tutorial articles about Adobe software because I'm like a design person. And so I, I wrote a few of them that intersected graphic design software with knitting. Um, maybe, I don't know, four or five of them. But um, there's a link to this article and it talks about how um, it talks about colorizing the charts and exactly how to do it. And so if you wanted a step-by-step -step tutorial, click on that link down in the description and it will, it will show you how to do it. Um, yeah, just kind of FYI for that if that's something that would be useful for you. All right, so we're going to talk about a couple of new magazines I got. 
and uh, I'm I'm very excited about these. I, I went through them a little bit today, and my my eventual goal is to get, and I'm thinking that's going to happen this summer, get one of the mega size scanners that I can actually scan these bad boys because these are, you know, they won't fit on like eight and a half by 11 scanner. Going to big get a big scanner and scan, digitize all these McCall's needleworks that I'm accumulating. Um, that's coming. I just, I haven't got that far yet, <laughs> but I will. Uh, so anyway, I have, I have two new magazines this week and, um, there we go. Oh, I've got a whole bunch of stuff over here. Let's get that out of the way. All right. So question for y'all is, um, oh, more ideas for what to name the blouse. That's great. Um, on, on this camera view, does this look blown out to you? Because from my perspective, it looks, it looks kind of blown out. And I don't know, like overexposed. And I don't know if that's coming across in the video or, um, or if it's just on my little monitor here, because we're going to, we're going to probably need to dial in some of the exposure, but I thought I'd ask you to see how it looks on your end. Um, Maniacal Moss said, use your phone and Adobe Scan. And I, I demoed that last week. And if you took a look at the, it, it is too bright. That's what I thought. Um, we'll fix it next week. Um, but today, if you, um, if you watched last week's video that went a little sideways at one point, but I fixed it. Um, I demoed Adobe Scan and it's, mediocre it's better for like if you need to scan a document to like fax into your water company or like you know something that's not that's not like archival doesn't have pictures so if you just have like a, a like a black and white you know utility bill or something like that it, i don't know w2 or whatever it's better it's better for that that adobe scan software it struggles when you've got different kinds of, let me show you this one. This may be a little bit better. I know it's not quite as, it's not as bright, so you'll be able to see it. So like this page is black and white and this page is all color and Adobe Scan really, really struggles with this. And so like one will look okay and one will look like crap. <laughs> so um, that's why, cause I thought, oh, I could, you know, save myself buying a scanner and I could just like take the pictures but it it didn't work as great as I thought I would as great as I thought I, it would and also like it it um if you have a flatbed scanner it's gonna like press down on the paper and like eliminate all the page curl and everything and so I think if I really want to do it right I need to I need to get a scanner and um yes as far as scan scan and editing um, I do have the full version of uh, Adobe Acrobat and so and that'll like run a optical character recognition on all of it and I know how to use you know Photoshop and and all that I've got certifications and in, in several Adobe programs and so like I know how to do all the editing at, to the PDF um, but I feel like the flatbed scanner is just gonna give me a it's gonna give me a better um, a better more consistent exposure on the the scans um, so that's what I'm that's what I'm gonna do I have dabbled with canva a little bit but honestly I I've spent like 20 plus years in Adobe land and so using graphic design software that's not Adobe is just like ah, I hate it I hate it so much because I don't know what the heck I'm doing anyway so I'm getting a I'm getting a flatbed scanner probably this summer and I'm gonna scan these but anyway, so I got two new, um, two new magazines. Thank you, Karen. And so this is McCall knitting, McCall needlework knitting and crochet. This is winter 1942, 1943. And this is, um, they used to do a lot of like embroidery type stuff on the front, um, like as a cover artwork, which I think is nice. 
anyway, so I just I thought I'd I'd share with you some of the the little tidbits in here. This was still pre. This was during World War II, um, and so it has like a very Americana, patriotic, you know, knit for the troops kind of a feel to it, and. Um, there's a, a really neat section in here called in the in the front of every single book, every single one of these magazines is called "Do You Know?" and it has like interesting tidbits. But the one that really caught me today was this one. It says, "Did you know that cow's milk is the raw material used in a new textile fiber known as Aralac? This fiber, a byproduct of skim milk, makes wonderful interlining material, warmer and lighter than wool." and um, I'm not, I've done a fair amount of research into different fiber types. I've never heard of Aralac. I've heard of like banana fiber and, you know, all kinds of different plant fibers and, and lots of things. I've never heard of one made from, made from milk before. So that was really interesting. I looked it up and apparently it was, um, I don't know if this is still the case, but like back in the 40s, skim milk or skimmed milk was like a byproduct of the dairy industry and like they I don't know if they like just fed it to the pigs or what but it was just a byproduct and so they some uh, scientists figure out how to like transform it into a fiber and and run it through like a spinner out I don't know if you're familiar with the the idea of um, um, acrylic where they take the, the the fiber and they run it through like little spaghetti strainer things and then they add crimp to it but it's the same idea as, as like a a man-made fiber or synthetic fibers, they run it through little, you know, little shower head of, um, of holes. And it, this was kind of the same idea. And it was supposed to be like this new great thing because, you know, wool was rationed because they needed it for the, the military uniforms. And even, I found out even dye was being rationed. And so there's some articles in here that talk about like, you know, be patriotic, you know, use white wool because we need to save the dye for I don't know what, <laughs> but like that was a, sign, a symbol of patriotism was, you know, just knitting with undyed bare yarn, which was interesting. Um, but apparently the, um, the Aralac, it didn't take off in popularity as much because people complained that when their, their garments were wet, they smelled like sour milk. <laughs> I, I would be very curious to see if it's like, if it's gotten any better since then. Um, I found some some Aralac for sale on I don't know somewhere online and I might buy some just and wash it just out of curiosity because I'm really I'm curious um, and Maz says it is called it's milk cotton um, and it's spelled if you're curious A R A L A C um, yeah so that that was interesting all right let's go back and look at this um, magazine a little bit more. I like it when um, the the magazine sellers they leave inserted like all the random papers and things that were in the magazine originally when they got it. This one is a it's a it's a checking like a checking deposit slip from the Pennsylvania National Bank and Trust Company. And it has um, a spot for fives, ones, and twos. Silver, like if you were going to deposit actual silver into your bank. Anyway, I've never seen a, a checking deposit slip like this before. So I thought that was really neat. Um, and then it has something on the back, slump, something to slip on. I'm not sure what that says. Anyway, this is a great, a great book. And I can't, I can't wait to get... To get into it more. Oh, one other thing I thought was really cool about this. So, this is 1942, and um, I saw in here <laughs> um, this is called Color Plus. This is space dyed crochet cotton, and it is, I think, in this issue, it was new. It was, it was brand new. And so the, um, oh yeah, here it is. For the very first time, you can crochet a stunning design in three colors and yet use only one ball of yarn for the work. 
And so this was sort of like the beginning of um, variegated yarn, I think. Um, pretty sure. And this was like a new, a new concept at the time. And so this was 19, 1942. So I have this other book. It's called the the Big Book of Knitting by Isab. Uh, the editor was Isabel Stevenson. And so in here, if you look at page, at the, if you look at the table of contents, there's a whole section called Knitting with Space Dyed Yarns. And it's on page 168. Yeah, here it is. Knitting with space dyed yarn. So you could do argyles and things. But it's got a whole chapter. And I believe it was sponsored, like this section was contributed and sponsored by the company that wrote that article or provided that article in the magazine. Because I think, I think this is, um, yeah, this was 1948. So this would have been six years after this other magazine came out. Anyway. Um, I've been I've been wanting to do more kind of research and um, an understanding of like the progression of the yarn, the yarn manufacturing and yarn availability from you know like as early as I can find, but definitely through the 30s, 40s, 50s. I think that's really interesting because you know the whole um, kind of production engine that like really ramped up during the, the World War II efforts. It really revolutionized a, a lot of industries, including uh, including the fiber industry. So yeah, so that's the first one. The second one I got is, so that was 1942. They're both 1942. The second one is, um, So this, this first one was summer 42 and the second one was winter 42, 43. Yeah, and they're both, they're both lovely. They encourage patriotism and, um, oh my goodness. They had some wild hats back then. This one looks like dreadlocks to me. What do you guys think? That's, uh, that's pretty wild. I haven't gone through them a whole lot, but I'm, um, I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be really neat once I I get them all scanned in and uh, I start I start highlighting them because I want to start highlighting them like all the different yarn companies, yarn manufacturers, different techniques and kind of like build a, a, a database of sorts to kind of piece together like the history of like when all this stuff was introduced. Oh also here you go. Here's that patriotic article that I, I was telling you about. You must conserve dyes and yarn. So knit something simple of spinnerin, undyed, fighting white yarn. Undyed yarn is somewhat the soft, flattering tone of this paper and breathtakingly lovely to both blondes and brunettes. I'm saving vital dye stuff for my country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know how that helps the war effort, but I wasn't there, so I can only speculate. <laughs> yes, that that hat did have dreadlocks with really big beads on it. <laughs> Wild. All right, what's next? Okay. Oh, I also wanted to share with you. I had talked about this before. Um, the, the McCall's magazines that I've been, I've been showing you, there is this great resource online called Something Under the Bed. She's been collecting a whole bunch of different kinds of magazines and, um, books for like over 20 years. And she has the, probably the world's largest collection and the most thorough kind of outline of them, um, anywhere. And she says she gets contacted by researchers pretty often about her collection. And I'm, I'm trying to duplicate, I'm trying to collect the ones from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And um, I, whoop, there we go. Hold on. Ah. Um, so that I can scan them. 
And I, I had talked last week about how I was going to like put together a spreadsheet. And I got started on that, but it's more involved than I thought. So I haven't got that far, but I will. I will soon. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in the kinds of projects that were available during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, I would check out this website because she's just done a fabulous job. And um, there is a link to this in the, the show notes. All right, so copper cardigan. Oh, man. I got very close to finishing this. Very, very close. And then I, um, <laughs> I, I gave up. I had to phone a friend. But anyway, I thought it would be, I thought it would be useful to, um, to share with you why I got, why I got stuck and how I'm going to try to fix it going forward. So this, the copper cardigan is, is super big on me, super big. And I'll put it on so you can see. It's, it's just ginormous. And I think there's a, there's a couple reasons for that. The first one is that I used probably a bigger weight yarn than I should have. I'm looking for the, the outside. There we go. And then I used alpaca, which I probably shouldn't have because alpaca doesn't, it doesn't have any memory and it uh, stretches a lot. Those are my two issues. <laughs> so here's my, here's my copper cardigan. And it's, it's huge on me. It's very big. And I was doing a little comparison and I wanted to see like, cause I got gauge and it, and it said that, you know, it was supposed to be like 36, 36 or 40 inches around and I, I got gauge according to the pattern and it, it fit it well it fit the model um, I wonder if they were doing some funny business with the styling or or what but I I tried it on um, myself and it didn't fit but then I held it up to my let's see three there we go I held it up against my favorite hoodie that fits pretty well and what I noticed like the measurements were the same the measurements were the same but the the real the only difference with this besides the fiber content of course like this is a this is a cotton poly blend the measurement difference it has to do with these gussets right here and so if I measure from from here to here, so this is the normal armhole, like the top of the sleeve. This is, I don't have a tape measure with me, but I think that's about nine inches. And then if you add this, this little triangle gusset right here, that's gonna increase that armhole depth probably another three or four inches. And so that makes like a 12 inch armhole. And since the, the armhole goes so deep, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of extra fabric there in the, in the underarms and that's gonna kind of have an effect on like the bust circumference and that that those darn gussets I think are what make make the thing look so gigantic um, Karen asked me did I find Virginia Bellamy articles in those magazines I did not but um, I think I think those predated when she first got published in McCall's. I think they did. I'm not 100%, but I think, I think they did. So one of the reasons I've been, I've been wanting them is I wanted to see the, the types of articles, the very magazines that Virginia would have had. They would have been in her possession. She would have been probably knitting from them, learning from them as she was developing number knitting. And so I, I wanted that frame of reference for um, for going forward because we do have some of the magazines they've got um, they've got a lot of garter stitch designs um, that I think probably would have been very inspirational to her and so I I wanted to have that background so that's why I am collecting them <laughs> so the the pattern here 
there we go so these gigantic gussets well they're not they're not gigantic sometimes Virginia does like teeny little gussets like you know a little one inch gussets uh, but these ones are like full size squares and I think if I was to take these gussets out or maybe make them like half size I think this thing would fit a lot better um, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure exactly what direction we're gonna go on this but um, I think I think that that's going to help quite a bit. So, gussets. <laughs> and if if you're if you're working on a, a sweater with um, with gussets, or even without gussets, it like if you need extra room in in your bust area. Like let's say for example, you have a uh, you make a sweater that fits your waist, but you just you know like it's a tube but you just need more room in the bust you don't necessarily have to do gauge shifting like Virginia did although it's awesome what you could do is you could add some little side gussets like maybe some um, divided um, divided triangles under here and that's just going to give you more um, more width around the bust area without affecting the nice waistline so think about what you know when you're when you're working on your sweaters consider like your fabric weight like this is kind of a heavy fabric i think this thing weighs like 22 ounces which is a lot which is like 12 ounces more than virginia said it would <laughs> would be so it's it's a lot and it's you know it's a heavy duty fabric it's um it's very heavy for the south which i live in the south <laughs> what was i thinking anyway it's lovely um but like if you have a if you have a heavier fabric just consider your fabric weight when you're planning out your gussets and your ease. Like a heavier fabric generally needs a little bit more positive ease than like a thinner fabric. Like for my thin fabrics, I kind of like some negative ease because it, I think it just, it fits nicer and it doesn't work for everybody, but that's what I like and it works for me. So just, you know, think about that because the, if we choose, if we choose a yarn that's different than what's specified in the pattern, um, then you might have different results. But Virginia just said, b plus weight yarn she didn't she didn't offer any other advice as for what type of yarn to use which i love i love that about her because it's like you know i'm a freewheeling kind of knitter but um that comes with some unexpected hazards <laughs> and i feel like i feel like i hit every one of those hazards on this sweater but i love it even though it's too big on me so this is this is copper cardigan. Um, I need to I need to finish it, but it's um, I'm gonna get it finished. I don't know that I'm going to be the one 100% to finish it. I think I need help, but <laughs> that's gonna be crossed off the list soon. And oh, in case you were wondering what sweater I was um, I was comparing this to, this is the Secret Society hoodie in my shop, and this is a size small. And I think it measures, it's a it's like a unisex sizing and it measures 20 inches across. And I think it's got a nine inch armhole, which for me is very, it's very comfortable. I like that a lot in, in this weight of fabric. Okay, next up. Um, oh, so on this sweater and on the copper cardigan, I have a, I have a, a thing that I'm learning. So if you've, you know, you've finished your last unit and you've knitted it together and you've got, you know, the yarn ball still attached and all you have to do is seam it together. Do you use the same yarn, like the same yarn tail that you just finished knitting with to do your seaming? Because I did. And I'm not going to do that anymore. I did it twice. I did it on this and then I did it on that copper card again. So I finished, you know, I finished the whole thing. I seamed it up, but then I found out, I think I need to rip out the gussets, but like the, the gusset, <laughs> the end of the gusset yarn is like what I used to seam it. And so now I have to do some snipping and I don't know where to snip and I'm just like kind of intimidated by the whole thing. So I would highly recommend don't, don't use your the yarn tail that you're knitting with to seam. Just break it off. It's okay. Grab yourself a new bit of yarn 
to do your seaming with in case something goes awry, when something goes awry, because eventually something will, because it never goes perfect. All right, um, so let's talk about alpaca. Alpaca, oh man. So that sweater, that copper cardigan was, I think it was like a 80-20 alpaca blend, something like that, 80-20 alpaca wool. It's mostly alpaca and it's it's luxurious. I love it, um, but it's it's heavy and I, I love it. <laughs> so I wanted to show you this yarn, this book, and I think I've talked about this book in the past, The Knitter's Book of Yarn. So I had been knitting for like, 30 some odd years before I got this book because, you know, I got it when it was relatively new. Um, and this book is amazing. It has all these different, it talks about all these different breeds of um, animals. There's protein fibers, cellulose fibers, synthetic, cellulosic. Um, so it's kind of, it can be a little sciencey, but it like breaks it all out into the different types of fibers and it talks about all of them and their qualities and what they're good for and like how they're made and how they're processed. It's just like, it will help you gain a better handle, like a better understanding of your yarn as a knitter. Cause I don't know about you, but when I go to a yarn stop, I like walk around and I start, I just start touching all the yarn <laughs> to see what feels the best. And then that's that's what I get. And so sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't work out so great. And so um, if if you want to be less willy-nilly and more like, and I know, gosh, willy-nilly, that's a really popular knit guy on Instagram now. If you want to be more purposeful, how about that? Um, in, your, in your yarn choicing, choicing, selecting, purchasing, that's a better word, yarn purchasing. <laughs> um, get this book. And so I thought I'd flip to the section on um, alpaca. And it, it's got a couple of whole pages on, um, yeah, on alpaca. And it talks about where it's made and like how, uh, what the different breeds are and um, colors, uh, like fiber length, importing uh, properties. It's just, it's phenomenal. And um, then it has a whole section in here about like how it behaves when you knit with it, which is fabulous. So this part is really interesting. Um, remember the warmth factor. Although not as warm as cashmere, alpaca fiber has a hollow core that helps it hold in heat, making it several times warmer than wool. While there's no law stating that you can't knit a sweater out of bulky alpaca, just remember that it's going to be warm, dense, and potentially heavy. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's true. That is true. Mm. Um, but yeah, so if you go, you know, throughout the whole book, it's got, it's got patterns that were designed with specific yarns in mind, and it, um, it talks about you know, why the, the yarns behave in such a way and how they contribute to that specific pattern, which is really interesting. Because, you know, if you look at most modern knitting patterns, they'll say, you know, use brand X and you'll need six skeins of it. But like, they don't tell you necessarily why. And so unless you're like really into yarn research to try to, you know, or you just happen to know, like to be able to understand it on your own, it it can be it can be a little tricky to find a good substitute i mean you you know if you go to a, a shop that has got knowledgeable people that helps but like why not you be the knowledgeable one so yeah so knitter's book of yarn it's amazing it's it's just fabulous it'll really help you understand your your yarn better oh stephanie says for seeming if i am knitting a a garment that is thicker yarn, I will seam with a thinner yarn. That's a good idea. That is a good idea. Oh, Karen says, let's make possum fiber sweaters for the next knit along. <laughs> well, first of all, girls, you're gonna need to start saving your pennies because I bought some possum yarn once. And granted, I like to buy yarn 
on closeout when I can get it. Like, this is really sad, but like shops go out of business pretty regularly because yarn, the yarn business is tough. Um, so, you know, a shop goes out of business and they're like, everything, 45% off. And I'm like, yeah, hi, I'd like to place an order. <laughs> and so I did that a couple of years ago and they had possum fiber yarn and I have two skeins of it. And the, the retail price of this, it was like 50 grams. The little ball like this, it was like $26. <laughs> so if you have a 50 gram ball of possum yarn and you need like, I don't know, 10 of them for a sweater, what's that? It's almost $300 in yarn. <laughs> Woo! Not to say that it wouldn't happen someday, but like I would think I would think long and hard about making an entire sweater out of possum yarn. <laughs> I'm happy to say though that I, I have one in my stash and I love it. Here it is. Well, this is a little a little sweatery thing that I made. So the this is like some sort of a um, hand dyed super wash something or other it's lovely but all this thin stuff in here this like pink stuff that's all possum yarn and it's um it's lovely it's very thin it's like a lace weight and it's i don't know four ply lace weight it's it's scrumptious and it's ultra soft um but it's pricey <laughs> <clears throat> all right so um oh one other thing before we get into the knit along. <laughs> Let's, we're not going to do possum yarn? No? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think there's no possums. So what we could do is we can make a sweater and then just do like chain stitch border on the collar in possum, right? <laughs> so I'll buy one ball of yarn and then I'll like send you each five grams or 10 grams and you can each like chain stitch, <laughs> chain stitch around your collar. And then it'll be awesome. Mm. All right, so I found this today, maybe a couple days ago, and I thought this was, this was really interesting to me. All right, so this is, this is domino knitting. We've talked about this plenty of times, love it. As far as I can tell, in her domino knitting books, she only uses mitered squares. Um, not like the seven shapes like Virginia does. Okay, but what I like about this is that she, on page uh, five, six, um, she talks in here about her history with domino knitting, and she mentions Virginia. Um, in the United States, I found a copy of a pamphlet from 1946 with the sweetest jacket knitted in domino squares by Virginia Woods Bellamy. In 1952, she published a book on the technique called number knitting. Okay, so she specifically mentions domino squares, which is great. Now we have in, um, let's see, where is it? I have showed you, I have showed you this before. This is number knitting pamphlet number one. And this is the only known copy in existence. Well, I have the digital copy. Um, but so this was published, this was advertised in McCall's, McCall's 1945 and 46, number knitting pamphlet number one in the second, so that would have been um, the spring edition, it was advertised, and in the fall winter edition of that year, number knitting pamphlet number two was advertised. So Th Vivian doesn't say whether she is was referring to pamphlet number one or pamphlet number two but she says it was the sweetest jacket made with domino squares so this is a great little pattern it's cute but it's it's not squares these are rectangles this like this is all log cabin kind of stuff it's lovely you know matching baby jacket matching baby hat baby shoes mom jacket matches the baby jacket it's not squares though however the number knitting pamphlet number two, which we don't have a copy of, was advertised in McCall's 1946, and it uses domino squares. This is the missing pamphlet. This is the missing pamphlet. And Vivian, Vivian said 
that she found the cutest pamphlet from 1946, the cutest jacket made with domino squares. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking Vivian Hawksborough might have a copy of number knitting pamphlet number two. <laughs> what do you guys think? Like, do I, do I reach out to her? <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to have to think long and hard about that because I don't know. Anyway, yes, that is the, that is the Hampton cardigan that um, I worked with Stephanie to develop a chart for us. Stephanie knit it. It's amazing. I think she's working on her second, um, the second edition right now. Um, and it's, I'm going to see if I can find it real quick to show you. It's, it's amazing. It's a great sweater and it has taught me so much. There it is, Hampton Cardigan, round five. So this is the the pattern that I charted for Hampton Cardigan based on that photograph in McCall's 1946 and also a photograph of that same sweater put out in an article by Piecework Magazine a few years ago. So this is this is the Hampton cardigan from that book. But I'm thinking, I'm thinking Vivian Hawksborough might have a copy of that pamphlet. And that would be amazing. <laughs> hey Vivian, if you're watching, call me. <laughs> Let's chat. <laughs> oh man, that was that would be awesome. I would love that so much. Um Oh, Anita, do you know her? Do you know her? Or I know because you guys are from the same country. Um, I'm thinking it would be better if maybe, maybe you reach out to her. Yeah. I'll email you. <laughs> I would love to interview her. I don't know how that would work with like the whole time zone difference, but... Oh, I'll be in touch with you, Anita. That that sounds like that sounds like that could be very interesting. Okay, so we were talking about we were talking about the Hampton the Hampton cardigan. That was the one I just showed you. But our knit along for uh, for this quarter, I guess, is the. Um, the Hampton shirt sleeveless sweater. And I realized as I was knitting this that I, I made a mistake in the pattern. So the original pattern, for what it's worth, the original pattern also had a mistake, but that's okay. Mine was a different mistake. So I redrew the chart so that each, each box, like your box number will be like all of your stitches for your whole each mitered square. So like my, I think mine is like 16. My box number is 16. Some of you might have a box number of like 24 or whatever. If you go on the website, um, which should be linked down in the comments below, or comments, discussion, description, description. It'll take you to the Knit Swag website where you can like plug in your, your bust measurement and your gauge and it'll tell you, it's like a little stitch calculator, it's going to tell you what your box number is. And um, I like that because that's not like size small, medium, or large. It's like, you know, your gauge to fit you. Um, so it, that'll help you calculate your box number. Um, yeah, so I wanted to show you what I've been doing with mine. So the way that this, well, first, let me show you the pattern again. Um, I messed up here. So if you notice the unit numbers, they are, you know, one, two, three, four, and then they go back this way, and then across, and then over. And I, I goofed up in that I labeled this the second row, and I labeled this the first row because it's at the bottom. But if you knit this according to the, the way in which Virginia has you knit it, this is actually the fifth row, not the first row. And so this would be fifth, first, second, third, fourth. And so I went, I went back to see um, actually how, 
how Virginia had done it. Hampton shirt. There we go. And she did it correctly. She labeled this the fifth row, first, second, third, fourth. So I just I just goofed up. But one of the things that's that's tricky about this is that normally if you have a mitered square, the first thing that you'll want to do, like if you're moving on to the second square, you know, you knit your squares, and generally what people will do is they will rotate it and they'll pick up and they knit they knit um, counterclockwise. And so if you look at the original mulberry bush blanket, it the whole thing is just counterclockwise mitered squares. But this is really is tricky if you're not paying attention because in this instance she has you pick up to the right and that's not typical because usually what people will um, and the reason is because if you're picking up like you know on this side in a different color you get all these all these like pearl blips these color blips here and so that's why um, people like to pick up on the left side of the unit as opposed to the right side so if you are knitting this if you haven't cast on yet be sure <laughs> because we run into a little issue um, be sure you you actually are going to be picking up from the back side of the work and so you're working row one that away and then row two that away and row three that away and so on so that's a little a little hiccup um, the yarn choice for this is um, it's it's uh, alpaca. It's an alpaca cormo blend that I spun. And let me see if I can bring this picture up. There we go. Yes. Okay. So a few years ago, I went to visit my friend Mackenzie and her alpacas. So this is her alpacas and me. And they didn't really like me. <laughs> I don't know that alpacas. They're kind of shy. They're curious, but they're shy, and I don't think they like strangers hugging them, which is why one of the alpacas was like trying to get away from me. <laughs> but anyway, this is Paxton and Bentley, and that's who this fiber is from. Um, yeah, so every year Mackenzie gets her alpaca sheared. One is a suri and one is a huakaya. And if you're not familiar with alpaca breeze, the suri is like long silky locks, and they're shiny and they're kind of straightish. And the huakaya, they're like teddy bears, and they're super, super fluffy and, and, and crimpy, and it's just, it's really interesting. And so she has one of each, and they're jet black. And so every year she shears them and drops off like five or six pounds of fiber on my doorstep. And so uh, I got it blended with some cormo, and I think cormo is like a cross between a cordial, cordial? Cordial and merino. Steve got me a fleece a few years ago for Christmas. So I took some Cormo, I took the alpaca fleece and I sent it to the mill and said, blend it up and dye it. And she did. So that's what this is. This is hand spun. It's like a, like a lace weight. It's lace weight because that's how I spin. It's, it's really fine. <laughs> um, okay, so we've, we've discussed how to, you know, how to knit this and if you wanted to do gauge shifting, because she doesn't, Virginia doesn't talk about that in the book, um, for this particular particular sweater, but I decided to give it a try. And one of the problems with hand spun is is that the the it's not super consistent. I mean, I try to make it consistent, but I don't know if you guys can see this. Like this is the biggest square, <laughs> and it, it's also the first square. This was on size five needles. So like this whole row I did on fives and then um, I jumped to, it might've been six. Uh, oh yeah, this was six. And then I jumped um, to eights here. This is all on size eight because this is the bust area. And then I'm doing this whole row on sevens. This is gonna be the shoulder area. And then I'm gonna go back down here and I'm gonna do this on um, fives. And so if you want, to have some some subtle shaping to give you more um, like more have it fit a little bit better <laughs> come on tank top <laughs> stay up <laughs> um, you can alter your needle sizes to help with that 
and um, Stephanie says she's almost done with hers and hers is it's sunny she's doing a long sleeve version and I'm also I'm thinking I'm gonna do a long sleeve version as well um, instead of knitting straight across here note to self when I'm tired tonight and I'm you know about to cast on for this unit um, don't <laughs> don't do it um, I'm gonna have it like a split neckline here um, and then sort of like making because I think the original pattern is sort of like a boat neck neckline it goes um, let me see if I can show you a picture of it yeah so it it is a kind of like a boat neck and it goes you know right up right up to the necktie but I'm gonna do mine split right here and I'm gonna um, do a little bit different color so it you know it just has a it's more open in front so that's my plan. I'm also going to do sleeves somehow, but I haven't, I haven't figured that out yet. Because all the sweater patterns that I've seen that are like mitered squares all the way down, like the cover cardigan that I showed you, and also the Hampton cardigan that um, was in the 1946 magazine, and um, then Stephanie um, made it. The if you, do, if you do the sleeves all the way down using mitered squares and keeping the stitch count all the same, and just do gauge shifting, it's it's I haven't seen it yet where the sleeves like taper down enough and so that means the sleeves are really wide and so what I think I might do I think I might um, actually adjust the stitch count for the sleeves still use the mitered squares still use like the thinner the smaller needles but like if you if you can see here this is a, a sweater I made and it's um, I'll show you the big no that's all blown out um, this is a, the diamond design sweater that I modified and so um, when I got to the sleeves instead of instead of doing them like the same stitch count and just you know adjusting the gauge that would have been too much because this is like a super fluffy metallic mohair sort of thing I used the same needle sizes all the way down and I just decreased the stitch count so I think it was like I don't know 14 12, 11, 10, something like that um, for my, my box number for these. So I think that's what I'm going to do on my, um, my, Hampton, my Hampton cardigan is adjust the stitch count, not, not just the gauge. Um, any idea why... Virginia had us knit the hip line last you know I was I was thinking about that and I think I think I know why so if you look at if you look at this chart, this is my guess, because I'm not Virginia. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. So if you look at the way the ridges are going, the, the ridges are, she had you knit kind of like in a ski track, a ski track fashion, so like back and forth, right? You're zigzagging here. But if you look at the way the ridges are going right at the hip line, normally in a sweater, you'd have ribbing at the at the base. And so, and I think this one does too. Yeah, it's got it's got a couple inches of ribbing right here. And so I'm thinking maybe she just wanted to kind of like continue that vertical line. Cause she was really into like continuing lines and like having really nice mirror images and just like just nice lines and I'm thinking because all of these edge stitches here they were all going to be the the ridges were going to be going vertically that would have a nice pleasing line down to the ribbing that's that's kind of what I think because otherwise it would be the ridges would be going horizontally and I don't think she wanted that I mean she could have had you like knit knitted differently because these are like 
you start on one and go to the right to number two. And so they're like side by side by side, moving from left to right. But the way she has you knit 17 through 20, it's like on top of each other, 17, 18, 19, 20. Same with like, so all these, these odd rows, that would, they're all knit on top of each other, if that makes sense. No, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it kind of does. So yeah, so they, they knit like on top of each other. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that made any sense. Okay, it does. <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, let's talk about bodice blouse. Bodice blouse with cape scarf. Uh, so, are any of you doing that one? Have any of you decided, because I've had like, I don't know, a whopping five people download the pattern. Are any of you actually knitting it? Bodice blouse with cape scarf? It is, it is a learning experience for sure. So let me open that chart up real quick because it's, um, <laughs> it's terrifying. Bodice blouse. There we go. All right. So for reference, I'm going to show you the bodice blouse from the book. I've tried to make mine less terrifying than Virginia's. All right. So this is the one from the book. And it's, um, <laughs> if this doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. <laughs> what the what? And so then it has a second section. So this is the back and this is the front. Just like, I don't know, kind of oriented differently. Oh no. Yeah, this is, yeah, the back and the front. And then you go on to, oh, page oh there's more so this is the second page of the chart and then there's the little cape scarf thing yeah and so what I did is I color coded I color coded it so you can see which needle sizes to use and this makes it a lot less scary uh, once it's color coded yeah, it's a lot more approachable now, I feel like. Um, and it does have the two pages. So this is, um, this second page is just for the borders. So you don't need to worry about all these white ones that aren't numbered. Uh, it's just sort of like a schematic, like telling you, you know, it's a schematic. And then there's the cape scarf, which is, um, which is the little blousey thing that, that she's wearing in this picture. Yeah, so um, that's bodice blouse. Um. <laughs> oh, you know, not everybody knits, like everybody knits at different speeds and, and that's great. And I know everyone has like different projects that they're working on that they're knitting that don't have anything to do with number knitting. Um, generally, like everything I knit is number knitting from the book <laughs> because I'm like, I'm going to knit all the patterns. Um, so yeah, if you're still working on the other patterns, that's okay. I, I'm still looking forward to seeing like all the, the things that you knit. All right. So let's, let's show you, um, get this stuff out of the way. So I'm on unit three on, on bodice blouse. So this one, this is unit one, and I have got these handy dandy little stitch markers. And I know some people like to just like tie a, you know, a stitch marker on the front. And that's great. I usually just do that. But sometimes, sometimes the units are like, they're so confusing. Like I really need the extra help. <laughs> and this is one of them. So this is unit one. It's on size six. This is unit two. It's on size seven. And then we go over here to unit three. And this is on 
say it's 13s. This is a sleeve. And I screwed this up twice before I finally got this right. Because normally, like with unit one, it's the same number of stitches as unit two, right? Yes. And so I did unit three and I was like, okay, just cast on the same number of stitches. And um, I think this is like 36 and I cast on another 36. And then I, I knit for like, I don't know, three or four hours. And then um, I found a drop stitch. And I was like, oh, I have to rip back and fix that drop stitch. But then I was ripping back and I was like, I totally, totally screwed that up. And so I ripped it out and redid it. And, you know, I knit again for a couple hours. And then I looked at my schematic and I was like, gotta be kidding me. <laughs> like, I screwed this up again. Ah! <laughs> okay, so what you do, and this is wild. Wow. Wow, Virginia. I love it. Making me crazy. Okay, so you you do 36 here, and it's 36 because like yours, yours might be different. My box number is, I think, 12? I think my box number is 12. Yeah, my box number is 12, and it's three boxes high, so that's 36. So you do 36, and then you cast on another 36 for 72, and then you cast on another another 72. So at the beginning of this unit, it's 72 by 72 stitches, and it takes forever. And this is on fingering weight yarn on size 13 needles, and um, <laughs> this is very, it's this hard. Um, oh yeah. I will give you the Etsy shop. It's called, I will let you know. The The girl, the, the listing where I got them, um, I just told her what I wanted. Because normally the, they come in like, you know, 5, 10, 15, you know, 20, whatever. And I was like, I want 1 through 40, all of the numbers. And she's like, okay. And she just made them for me. I think it was a, a custom thing. Um, it's sheep, sheep, sheep to shawl, sheepishly. I will let you know. I will put that down in the description. Um, but probably any one of those Etsy shops that does like the numbered stitch markers, you just tell them what you want and they'll, they'll probably make it for you. Uh, but yeah, I will put her shop listing down in, in the description because they will, those will really help you. Um, Virginia had said in her book to tie numbered price tags onto the units. And so um, I don't really have a, I don't have numbered price tags, but I have these sandy dandy little stitch markers. And I like to think that if Virginia had access to these little numbered stitch markers, she would probably use them too. Yeah. Anyway, so I have my, my yarn here. Um, this is, I bought three skeins of this and I always, I never buy enough because like, <laughs> that's how I roll. So I bought three of these and I bought one of the light blue for um, for the, the cape scarf thing. And I wound them up. I wound up two balls. And then I, I got through like, I don't know, the first two units in the house. So I was like, I lost one of my balls of yarn. Like where the heck did it go? I mean, I know I have a good size yarn stash. It's not very organized. It's like a pile and my bookshelf. <sighs> Anyway, I was knitting along, knitting along, knitting along, and then all of a sudden, I came, I came to a knot in my yarn, and I was like, "Woo!" I wound both balls, both hanks of yarn, onto the same, the same ball. So that was exciting. I found my yarn. I found my missing yarn. <laughs> it's um, the, the story in the Bible where Jesus leaves the 99 sheep to go after the one. And I'm like, I have all 99 balls of yarn on my shelf and I go after the one. I'm like, yes, <laughs> I found the one. <laughs> oh. Okay, so Anita says, get a centimeter tape measure and cut them in one, two, three. Oh, and put them on your stitch marker. Oh, that's a good idea. Like one of those little, one of those little zippy tape measures and then just like snip them and put, oh, that's a good idea. And those things are, what are they like? Four dollars, five bucks? Yeah, that's that's cheaper than the <laughs> the stitch markers that I bought on Etsy. Yeah, that's a good idea. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So I think that 
that about covers it for me for like all the, the progress of, you know, the different projects I'm working on and like my crazy stories of the week. Um, so this is super fun. I got to get my, my marching orders again if I can find, find something to write on. Okay, so I talked last week about putting together that spreadsheet of like which mag which McCall's magazines that I have, and I'm I'm working on that. It just took it took longer than I thought it would. Yeah, so I'm gonna work on that, um, and I'm gonna keep plugging away on my bodice blouse and my Hampton my Hampton sweater. Um, it's probably going to be a few weeks before Copper Cardigan is done because there's still some figuring out to do. But that's going to, so that might take, take a little bit of a break for um, a few weeks. But I'm going to keep plugging away on these ones. Yeah. So if you, do you guys have any questions or like any, any comments about the, the patterns we're working on for our knit along? And please do post in the um, post in the Ravelry group. Um, I have threads going for the Hampton shirt and the the bodice blouse. Um, and I'm thinking I'm thinking I'm probably going to do some like variations on the Hampton shirt once Copper Cardigan is out of the way because I don't like to have too many projects on the needles at once. It kind of stresses me out because I feel like I'm neglecting them if I like don't give them a lot of attention. <laughs> like they know. Um, but I'm thinking I'm going to make a Hampton cardigan for like, um, for a kid because, you know, I just calculated different chest measurement, right. And, you know, different gauge and cast on. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to give that a whirl here in the next, um, like between now and the end of June, cause this knit along is going through all of April, May, June. So, um, I'll probably knit one or more baby sweaters. All right, friends. Uh, I think, I think that's about, that's about it for for me today. <laughs> Be sure to always get a strapless bra boned and fitted to your figure. <laughs> because the shoulders are always lovelier without straps. <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. <laughs> oh, Bob wants to know what is sea weight yarn? Let's talk about that real quick. Oh, I don't need to get the, I don't need to get the hard copy. I've got the, I've got the digital copy. That's right. Um, let's see. I think that's like around page 50. So Virginia did, I think sea weight yarn is like a worsted weight. She was, as far as I know, like the first person to, um, to have, there it is. Um, she was the first person to talk about kind of trying to standardize yarn weights. And so she came up with four different weights and she doesn't give any like wraps per inch or anything like that in here. Cause that wasn't really a thing back then. I don't think at least not among knitters. Um, but she, she has, you know, fine two ply, which I think is like lace weight and then baby three ply Afghan, which is probably like a worsted weight and jumbo. And I don't know exactly what jumbo is, you know, in like vintage yarn approximations. But according to her, C weight yarn is Afghan weight yarns or Germantown. So I'm thinking that's like a worsted weight. Um, and she has you, you know, do up your own approximation of, of, approximate stitches per inch. Of course, this is totally going to depend on the yarn that you're using and like what size of needles that you're using and like, you know, how stressed out you are and how tired you are, or maybe how much you've had to drink. So <laughs> all of those are considerations too, but sea weight yarn is like, um, is like a worsted weight yarn. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Retirement week. Right on. I'm excited for you. <laughs> That's really cool. I got like 20 years to go. <laughs> so, well, this has been fun. Thanks for coming. And um, thanks for, thanks for listening to me 
<laughs> with no audio at first. Put the batteries in backwards. Hey. Anyway, thanks for that. Maybe I'll edit that part out of my video or just leave it in there for entertainment purposes. <laughs> so I will see you all next week. All right. Take care. Bye, guys.